This Torah class is brought to you by TorahAnytime.com. It's of course obvious that if you want to buy a car, the uh, intelligent buyer would not just go into a, a showroom and say, I like that one. It has a sleek look and uh, just go and kick the tires and smell the leather and say, this one is for me. That's a pretty foolish way of buying a car. You know, how much miles to a gallon? Uh, is it going to be easy to park? Is it uh, uh, going to need a lot of uh, service? Uh, what kind of oil is it going to use? I mean, there's all kinds of variables that you have to know in order to be an intelligent purchaser. Uh, picking a, a husband, in this case, uh, which is going to define all of your life in this world, uh, whether it's going to define the happiness of your life, the accomplishment of your life, and as Rev Miller says, all of the next world, because marriage is for all of eternity. That's why Avram and Sarah are buried Zugos, and Yitzchak and Rivka and Yaakov and Leah are buried Zugos, Adam and Chava in the Mars of Machpela. Why are they buried as couples? So Ramilla would always say, because marriage is forever. So an investment forever deserves as much knowledge before you choose as possible. Uh, today's shear, uh, in a, a nutshell, will give you some of the qualities that you should be looking for. Uh, Number one, and I really mean to stress number one, it's a deal breaker. It's what uh, Rabbi Yechem and Zakai, after telling his five Talmidim to look for the most treasured Mida in the world, and this was not just a scavenger hunt, this was not just for color war, I always felt that the purpose of Rabbi Yechem and Zakai was to teach us what to look for on a date. And that's why he wanted to point out what is the most important midah, and that is a late tave. Uh, in a word, kind. I always told all my children, I want to know if he or she is kind. If you marry a kind man, you will have a good life. A kind man will take care of you if you have a fever. A kind man will offer to take out of the garbage and not wait to be asked if you had a hard day. A kind man will help you clean the table uh, Friday night when the kids aren't available to do it. A kind-hearted man will see that you're sad and try to cheer you up. A kind man will offer to help bring the bags from the car when you go shopping. Right? The, a kind man will tell you, you know what, you look tired, I'll take the next feeding from the baby, even though he worked hard that day. Right? So the, you, need, you need to look for kind. And uh, that's one of the things that you can usually tell. You know, certain things are hard to tell. But even when a boy is on uh, his best behavior on a date, but there's always little things that you could notice to see if, uh, if he is kind. And you have to ask about that. Do you find him kind-hearted? Uh, you know, and uh, so that's, that has to be first on your radar, and in my opinion, it's a deal-breaker. Number two. He should be healthy. That means that if you have everything that it takes uh, and he's a smoker, so then look elsewhere. Uh, a smoker can very easily leave you a young widow. You'll say, but who's going to marry the smokers? That's not your problem. Same way it's not your problem who's going to marry a cripple. It's not your problem who's going to marry a smoker. Actually, you might be better off with a cripple. Right? Because a smoker might kill himself. He might kill you with his secondhand smoke. 
He might kill your children with SIDS, sudden infant death syndrome. Right? So if you have what it takes, listen, if you have problems, you know, then uh, you might have to take a smoke. But if you have what it takes and he smokes, then look the other way. Get, get somebody else. Ramilla used to say, go for a walk. Go a healthy 10 blocks with him. And see if after the 10 blocks he's huffing and he's puffing. You know, check it out. You know, what's with him? Right? Health is a very important commodity. And again, sometimes a person has to give in to something. You know, it might be a girl, might have diabetes, and she might have to also take somebody with some kind of a health defect. Okay, uh, it, it, there's ways to work around it. We have good medicines nowadays. But if you have everything that it takes, then go for healthy. Third item. Maybe you should close the door. Third item. Thank you. Third, third item. Religiosity. Now, religiosity is very important. What do I mean by religiosity? When it comes to marrying a husband, it's too, this, the stakes are too big to gamble. What do I mean? Sometimes a girl finds a boy, he's about tshuva, and, uh, you know, he's, he has a long way to go, you know, uh, uh, he's, he's just learning the ropes. He doesn't go to Minion all the time. And, yeah, but he's, you know, he, he has a desire to learn. And when it comes to religiosity, you should always marry up in religiosity. Now this is, although most of the advice that I'm giving here is both useful for boys and for girls, this is something that I tell girls specially. You will become more spiritual after you get married. That's a given. Now why is that? Because you'll have a child. And when you have a child, all of a sudden you stop thinking only about yourself. You're not wrapped up in me, myself, and I. You have strong hormones, strong feelings to be concerned about your child. Now remember, for yourself, you have Yates heart. But for your child, you want the best. And all of a sudden, you become much more spiritual. Now, if you're trapped with a husband who is not so spiritual, yeah, you know... Uh, look, I, 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 want, I want to enjoy the good life, you know. I want to travel. I want to, uh, yeah, sure. Uh, yum and toy them. And I like wine tasting. And I like, I mean, you want somebody that has a strong sense of religion. Now, when you're dating... You're not just, this is very important, when you're dating, you're not just deciding on the quality of your life. You are making the most crucial decision on what kind of children you're going to have. So, for example, the Gemara tells us, Lo'olam yedabek odom b'toivim. You should always try to marry into a good family. Because Moshe Rabbein, who married the daughter of Yisro, now he married a great Tzedekas. Tzipporah was a great Tzedekas. As a matter of fact, the Rabbeinu Ephraim says, Moshe is bigamatria litzipporah. So he married his Bashelta. But Moshe Rabbeinu, who married Tzipporah, the daughter of Yisro, who was a former Kohen on, who was a former priest of idolatry, ended up having a grandson, Yohannesson, who worshipped idolatry. On the other hand, Aaron, who married Elisheba, 
who was the daughter of a great tzaddik, the daughter of Aminodov. And Aminodov was the father of Nachshain, who was the famous person that jumped first into the Yamsuf to show his faith, faith in Hashem. Ah, they had Pinchas. Pinchas ben, Ali, ben Alazir. They had the great Pinchas. Pinchas ben Alazir ben Aaron Akain. So, even two spectacular women, Tzipora and Elisheva, but marry into a good family. Why? Not because of what kind of wife you have. They were both great wives, Elisheva, Tzipora. We should be zeichet to any such women. But think about the children and the grandchildren. So you have what it takes. First of all, it's great to marry into good DNA, into good yichas. That defines who the children are going to be. But I'm not even talking about yichas. I'm talking about marrying someone who will help you produce good children. Marry someone whose ideology is that it will be very important to send the children to the best yeshivas and the best base yakos. It's not going to say, well, we have to think about the cheapest place because it's very expensive. A lot of times people decide for geographical conveniences or financial conveniences to use schools which are not so good. And then their children hang around friends, peers that are not so hot. And that's how children at risk and children that go off the derech a lot of times uh, come about because they went to yeshivas where the peers were not so good. They started hanging around in billiard rooms and in the back of the billiard room they were using drugs and it went from, from bad to worse. All because the father, it wasn't high on the totem pole of his priorities, was much more important to pay $900 a month for a fancy car than $900 a month for the tuition in the better school. So the person that you marry is not only defining your personal happiness, but what kind of children you're going to have. And remember, when you light the Shabbos candles, which is the time that you ask Hashem for what you want, your dreams, you say, you daven that my husband should only have eyes for me, which is very important, especially in today where men are bombarded by uh, all kinds of pictures of women. So a wife davens, my husband should only have eyes for me, and davens for children tell me they chacham. And that's why. I always tell the story. A wonderful young lady in my kehila came to me with a dilemma. What was her dilemma? She wanted to know she's dating a young man who has terrific meters. And she said to me, Rabbi Weiss, you always say kind, kind, kind. I never met such a kind-hearted man. But, there's a big but. He told me that learning is not his thing. He's not the bookwormish type. He never enjoyed sitting by a safer. He says he loves business. He'll support Torah, but, uh, so she said to him, will you learn every day? Well, if you really want me to, but it's not me. I'm telling you now, it's not me. I'm not the, I'm not the learning type. So she said, Rabbi, Rabbi what should I do? It, it, it hurts me to give up on such a good guy. But on the other hand, I always wanted a husband that's going to learn Torah. I know that Torah is important. What do you say? So I told her, you know, to be a Zavulan and to support Torah is a great thing. It says that the Badei HaOrein, the sticks that carry the Oren Kodesh and the Kodesh Kedoshim, were never allowed to be removed from the Oren. In other words, when it's housed in the Kodesh Kedoshim, it's with the sticks. Now, if the sticks are only for transport, why does it have to be in the Kodesh Kedoshim? So the answer is, is because the supporters of Torah are also holy of holies. The Zvulans of this world are holy of holies. Smach Zvulan b'tzei secha v'yisachar ba'alecha. Mentioned Zvulan before Yisachar, the Shevet of Torah. But, 
I told her, you can't expect your children to be more than their father. So if their children come home and your, your husband is reading the daily news or watching something on television or listening to the Met game on the radio, and that's their vision of their father, and Friday night he has a good beer and then just collapses on the, on, on the uh, easy chair, on the lazy boy, and on Sunday he goes out to play ball and golf and... You can't expect them to have a life of Torah. It's going to define who your children are. Is that what you want? She married a Ben Taira and she didn't marry that person. But that's important to keep in mind that who you marry is not just for you to be comfortable and for you to be happy. But you also have to realize the variable that you're marrying somebody who is going to have a big impact on who all your future generations are going to be. Let's move on. Next variable. Again, very important. Money. Money. Money makes the world go round. So the first thing is Does he have a job? Is he... Is he busy? You see, the Gemara tells us in Mesephus Ksuvus, Habatolo mevia lidei shi'amon. Idleness leads to depression. Now actually the Gemara points this out in regards to a woman. It says that if a woman is wealthy and she brings in, even if she brings in a hundred servants into the marriage, she comes from the Rothschild family, and she brings with her a flock of a hundred servants, the husband could still insist that she do a certain amount of work. Because it's, if she's idle, it leads to depression, or habatola mevieli de zima, it leads to immorality. When there's a vacuum, so either a person becomes depressed or it could lead to immorality. And this is true for a man as well. A man has to be busy. Ramila used to say if there was a shalom bias problem, the first thing you checked out on is the husband working. Because if the husband is not working, first of all, he's home too much. He's home too much, he's spending too much time around his wife. Too much time is no good because then he's going to find out all of her chesrinas. He's going to find she's pretty ordinary. It's, a, it's, it's, it's absence makes the heart grow fonder. It's not good to be on top of a wife all the time. But number two, if he's not gainfully employed, we were put in this world to do. Like it says in Kiddush, Asher Bora Elohim Hashem created that we should be productive. Asher Kim lasses to do. A person that's not productive is not fulfilled. If they're not fulfilled, if they're not happy with themselves, they're not going to treat you nicely. They're not going to be happy with your success because they're not they're not feeling good about themselves. Hurt people, hurt people. But it's more than that. In our society, especially, you need to have money. You need to pay a mortgage or rent. You need to pay Con Edison. You need to pay National Grid. You need to have a medical policy. You have to make money. And it says, shalom, chitim If there is chelev chitim, yazbiach, if there is the cream of wheat to keep you satisfied, then there's the board in your border's peace. Or like the Gemara Bav Metzia tells us, if the cookie jar is empty, then fights start. If there's no money in the house, then there's tension. So therefore, the person that you marry has to be gainfully employed. Now, what about learning? Well, learning is also gainfully employed. At that, you don't have the problem. That is, to the contrary, his mind is busy, he's fulfilled. How are you going to make a living? Oh, that needs to be discussed. Is there going to be support? Is, are you going to be working in a good job? How long? And then is he going to go 
into clay Kodesh. You should know that in today's society, if he's a Mitsuyan and he could become a Rebbe or a Rav, a lot of times they make great livings. So you'll say, nah, Rebbe, how much money can he make? You have to understand that a lot of times if he's a good Rebbe, his children uh, go to the yeshiva for free. Now, tuition could be thirty, forty thousand dollars without taxes if he is a good rebbe and he gets tuition free. So then, that's a huge chunk of money besides what he makes. Same thing is true with a rav. A rav a lot of times gets consideration with the tuitions. So therefore, that is a strong possibility. That uh, I know. I have an actuary in my shul. Uh, he's an actuary. She is a, a special ed. And they barely make it. And he told me that if he would have to do it again, he loves to learn. If he have to do it again, he thinks he would have done better staying in Kyle and getting a break in tuitions and camp instead of being an actuary. So, but, the, there has to be a plan. That's very important. Now, Ramilla used to say, if he tells you, yeah, I'm going to be a writer. Writer is pie in the sky. You know, he says, Ramilla says, tell him, show me your first bestseller and then we'll talk about it. Uh, that, that, it there has to be some kind of a plan. You know, he's, he's going in the night to accounting school. He's done, he says, some kind of, he's learning to be a, 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 a life coach. There has, to be, there has to be some kind of a plan. Because you have to know that if there's no money now, one word of caution about support. You have to realize that when you're getting supported, there are other controlling influences in your marriage. Because if you have a, a let's say, a father-in-law that's paying money, then your mother-in-law is going to have more of a say in your life. I had a case where a mother-in-law said, I want you to use this obstetrician. So the daughter-in-law was aghast and told her husband, your mother has some nerve telling me what, it's none of our business. I mean, I, I shouldn't have even told her I was pregnant. So the, mother, the son went back to his mother and said, you know, Ma, she's right. You know, that's between me and her. She says, listen, we pay the medical insurance. Don't tell me what's between. Without our medical insurance, you wouldn't have any doctor. You would be going to the clinic. So don't you have the chutzpah to tell. Now, the mother-in-law is a meddling mother-in-law, and she's not right. But it's a reality. And it's a reality that you have to be aware of. Also, you have to be aware of the reality that sometimes... There's a reversal of fortunes, and somebody that promises support could lose their money and not have support. You have to always be prepared for that eventuality. Okay, next. Learning. Now, I'm not talking here now kolel versus not kolel. That's a whole other shit. But there's one thing that you want to make sure, and that is that your husband has an interest and even a love for learning Torah. Now, why is that so important? Besides of what I talked to you about the children. First of all, you have to know that if you're like a, a, a normal person, you like everything great. You don't want mediocre. When it comes to your eternity, you certainly don't want mediocre. Forever and ever, you want to be a VIP. Who has VIP status in the next world? Ashrei mi shebole kan v'talmuda biyada. I always depict it. You go to an airport, and there's a long line stretching to get to the terminal. And then all of a sudden, you see somebody come in, and two stewardesses, come and usher him in through a little gate where he goes straight on to the plane to first class. He said, oh, that must be a big diplomat, diplomatic community. You want to go to the next world and have VIP status. Noshim bameh zachin, how do women merit special status in the next world? 
by Tayyip. So you want to have a nice chunk of Torah for the next world. Now it could be that it might, it might be that uh, your uh, husband is a pharmacist and learns in the morning and the night. That's also good. Remember, Echad Amarba Echad It's not a question of how much. The heart has to be in heaven. He's making up Anasa. That's good. But he's learning. And he's Mava Sedra. And the children fall asleep in the night hearing their Tati Lane by Dabar Shem Hamashem Lima. They fall asleep hearing their father sweetly learning. In the afternoon, he goes with the learning program. He takes your children to learn. You know, on Matzi Shabbos, he starts being Mava Sedra right after Havdalah to get a jump on the week, Sunday morning. He goes to a shir before you do something. Now, besides that, you have to know that there was a big fight, big fight between Yaakov and the Malach. A fight to the death. Right? Yaakov was left alone by the Mavor Yabok after crossing the crossing of Yabok. And a man wrestled with him until dawn. A fight like no other. A fight not like with Muhammad Ali or Mike Tyson. This was a fight to the death. Because we're told that that ish was Samoel. Or the Hasidim don't even pronounce it. They say Samkel. Samoel is the Malcham of us. That's a Samoel. Samkel, the poison of God. And he came to take Yaakov. It was a fight to the death. And he saw that he couldn't prevail over him. This is a huge part of the Torah. The Torah is telling us how to keep the Malach HaMovis at bay. How to keep him away. And the key is not Avram. It's not Yitzchak. It's Yaakov. Yaakov was what? Yaakov Ishtam Yoyshei Vayolim. Yaakov Ishtam, the perfect man, sitting in the tents. What does that mean, tents? He had a house in Borough Park. And he had a house in the Hamptons? No. Yaakov Ishtam Yoishei Vayoholim means that he sat in the tents of Shem Ve'ever. He was a man of Torah. Torah keeps the Malachim of us away. You don't want death in your house? Marry somebody that's Torah. That's, that's very, 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 very important. Torah is life. That's why you want Torah in your house. But there's something else. When you look for a young man, if that young man was schooled with good dosages of Musa, that means he went to a yeshiva where he heard once a week a Musa Shmuz. He had a Musa Seder every night. That means that this young man has been inculcated with Jewish values. He's been taught to always question if he's being selfish. He's been taught that being arrogant is abominable. He's been taught that it's not good to be self-centered. He's been taught never to want revenge. He's been taught to love somebody like himself or like Hillel said, what you don't like, don't do to someone else. He's been taught about Gezel Shina not to rob somebody else's sleep. He's been taught about not to say hurtful words. He's been taught especially that all of these values 
the most important person that he has to practice all these values are is on his wife. So you want to get somebody that's been inculcated with these values. Also, Torah is the passport for Tchir Sameis. Tal Oro Yistalecha. The dew of light is your dew. Vakitsaisa, when you awaken after the resurrection, he sitzichecha. That will be your speech. You want to have somebody that has a passport, not to go to Milan, not to go to Israel, not to go to Florida, but to go to the next world. Torah is the passport for the resurrection. It's clear, amazing. Next. Temperament. Temperament. Rabbi Yudah Chosid, the Sefer Chassidim, says that if a young man has a temper, it's a deal breaker. Like I heard from women who talked to me about Shalom Bayez, they told me plaintively, how could I love a man when I don't know when he's going to go off in a tantrum next and start screaming and using not nice words and even threatening to raise a hand to me. How could I love such a man? Now, this is hard to, this is one of those things that are really hard to know because a person is on their best behavior during a date. And uh, sometimes unless you get lucky and he has a flat tire and you see how he reacts. I know some shidduchim. I know one case the uh, young woman dated him 11 times and was about to get married. He had a flat and he started cursing and screaming and she saw his temper. And she said, oh, this is not for me. She was saved. One of the things you have to do is when your parents or whoever you have check out, you, and by the way, you get references, it's good to try to check out not from the references, because the references just say nice things. That's why they're the references. Uh, you should try to find out other friends and ask, is he excitable? Excitable, you don't say, is he a madman? Nobody's going to say he's a madman. Nobody wants to kill a shit. Nobody's going to say, he has a bad temper. Find out, is he an excitable type? And he says, yeah, yeah, he gets excited. Yeah. You already have to... Yeah, that, that, by the way, that's a very big thing in checking out a shidduch. If you want to hear the truth, you have to make both sides sound okay. Because otherwise, nobody wants to say bad. So when you want to know if the person enjoys their learning, you know, you have to realize that nowadays a lot of boys sit and learn because it's the easiest route. If they sit and learn, they, they could get all the girls to run after them, and they could ask for some support. So, and they don't have to study in college, they don't have to take that. They could just sit back in yeshiva, in the dormitory, drink coffee, and it's the easiest way. But if the boy is not really enjoying their learning, and when you marry them, they're not going to be very happy. You want to know, even if you marry a learning boy, you want to know if he's happy in his learning. So you want to get a good sense about where the boy's learning is holding. You call up the mashkiach and you ask the mashkiach, tell me, in five years from now, do you see him as maybe a Rebbe in yeshiva or a crackerjack New York life salesman? So the Rebbe says he's a crackerjack New York life saving, a salesman, so you get at least a sense that learning is really not his bad. Right? Uh, the same way, if, you know, you have to know yourself, date thyself first, but you have to know yourself. If, if you, you, you have to know, do you want an outgoing boy or a more quiet boy, a more introverted boy? Now, if you're going to say to somebody, is he an introvert? That sounds negative. It won't work. What you've got to do is you've got to ask the references, tell me, is he more of a last one to leave the chasana type, or more of a curl by the fireside with a book type. Now, 
Those are both not bad things, and they really aren't. But you'll get a sense of what kind is he? Is he, you know, is he the person that always likes to go out amongst people, if that's what you need? Always wants guests over? Or is he more of a quiet, cozy, let's enjoy each other's company and curl up for the night type, you know? You want to know, you, you, want, you want to get an idea of who he is, but don't use negatives when you ask the questions. Because if you use negatives when you ask the questions, you're not going to hear the truth. But if the person has a temper, I don't care. He could have a lot of other good miners. It's a deal breaker. Head for the hills. Next thing. How he spends his money. That's a very big thing. Is he cheap? Ramilla says cheapness is a deal breaker. If he's cheap, it's very hard to live with a cheap person. You know, you know, if you get me some a dishwasher, it'll make your life a lot easier. My mother didn't have a dishwasher. She never had a dishwasher. You don't need a dishwasher. Now, this is something you could check out on a date. The girl told me she went on a date. It was a freezing cold night. There was some ice on the ground. She was wearing high heels. And he asked her, they were going out to eat. He asked her, it's, it's all right. He found parking. It's 11 blocks from the restaurant. It's a good, good night. Does she mind walking the 11 blocks? Here she is, wearing high heels. It's icy outside, bone chilling. He wants to park 11 blocks away to save money on the parking. Or he takes her out to eat and he says, you know, is it all right if we share one meal? You know, that's the way you take a girl out on a date. You get a sense of cheapness. Cheapness is that you'll say, well, okay, cheap, so we'll, we'll have money, he'll be cheap. He'll say, no, cheap, it's the cheapness. Ramilla said cheapness throughout life is a very hard thing to live with. I have something which is usually not spoken about. It's called recreational compatibility. Now, I think this is important. Uh, I, I, I think this is an important thing. Um, Recreational compatibility is that you should enjoy to do certain things together. You see, they did a poll of 90,000 families in the 90s. It's scary because in the 90s, that's already 27 years ago, the 1990s, the early 90s, about how much time a husband and wife with two children spent alone together a week outside of the bedroom. Alone time. The national average of 90,000 couples was 19 minutes a week. Not a day, a week. How are you supposed to bond and have a special relationship if you don't spend time together? I found that couples that had common interests bond better. It could be that they like to do the crossword puzzle together. It could be that they enjoy shopping for antiques together. It could be that they love to fly kites together, play chess, scrabble, cook. Run, jog, sail, fish, shop. But recreation, now this is not a deal breaker. There are couples that love to watch Torah anytime that come together. But recreational compatibility is a very big aid to marriage. Because it helps you bond 
and become a stronger couple. There are certain things that you should know will define your marriage. One of, one of them is, will you have a television? That should be discussed. A television in the house changes the entire aura of the house. First of all, people find themselves often around the television. There's no family discussion time, there's no doing things, just they sit and they vegetate by the television. Also, your husband will be constantly bombarded by watching females who have been coached, makeup, hairdressed, to be looking seductive, pleasing, they make the right facial expressions, they speak the tendermost ways, and your husband will look at them and look at you and say, boy, I got a lemon. And there are women that bring this into their home. So television is something that should be discussed. Also, it should be discussed if he wants to live in Eretzel, or you want to live in Eretzel. See, if you have family over here, and you're very close to your family, and you want to be here, or you want to be here because you feel going to a place where the language is different, it's going to be hard for you, the culture is different, it's going to be hard for you, and he went to yeshivas in Eretz Yisrael, and his dream is to live in Eretz Yisrael, but he says he'll give it up for you. It's not always a good idea to have a young man give up his dreams, because he could always be unhappy, he could always blame you for it, and also, if after you have three kids, he says, listen, I want to live, go to Eretz Yisrael. I tried it your way. It's not working for me. What are you going to do? You're not going to say, well, I'm out of here with three kids and a husband. So it's not good to smash someone's dreams. So you should discuss these things. Right? If he says, look, I'm into Kirov and I want to move to Wyoming, or I want to go on Shlichus, or I want to... You have to know if that's for you. But these are things that you have to discuss from the get-go. Now another thing, you should watch out for any addictions. If you see a sense of addiction, you head for the hills. Now, if he sits by the day with his cell phone, I, I, I just have to text him. He's not even paying attention to you. He's looking at his phone on a date. That's, that's worrisome. That shows an addictive personality. That's a small thing. If a person is addicted to the computer, that's a dangerous thing. I know people that are addicted to the computer. They're not in bed in the night with their wife. They're on the computer. And then there's the worry also. The schmutz on the computer and conversations with other women on the computer. If a person likes to go to Atlantic City and he tells you about it, watch out. People have gambled away their homes because they were addicted to gambling. And the same thing is true if the person has a tendency to drink, takes you out, orders a bottle of wine. Takes you out, he says, let's drink a lachayim. Drinking causes wife beating and all kinds of terrible things and it passes on to the next generations. Any sign of addiction and you have to have a nose for it. That's why I'm telling you. Any sign of addiction, head for the hills. Now if you have a good day, you liked him. He said no. First of all, be happy. It wasn't your bashet. But besides that, you had a good date. The first thing you should do is think which one of your friends he would be good for. That's a great habit because your friends will then do that for you. 
You should daven your, for your friends. Because call them a spell, Bab Chavero, if you say, Who nene tchila? Now, there's a great book to read. It's called Dear Daughter by Rav Goldschmidt, all of our shalom. It's a great book to read. Put it on your reading list. Now, the author of Dear Daughter, I once had a zechia to hear a tape of a schmooze of his. He was such a wise, brilliant man. Such a brilliant man. The author of Dear Daughter said the following very important piece of advice. When you date, look for somebody that has Seichel HaYosha. Seichel HaYosha sounds, whoa, very lofty. What is Seichel HaYosha? Seichel HaYosha is somebody... Yosha, what does Yosha mean? In the Eitzel, you want to know where to go, they say, Yashar, Yashar. Seichel, right, exactly. Seichel Yosha means somebody that thinks straight. And he explained that this really is a very big, uh, it defines whether you'll have a peaceful marriage. Why? Because if you marry somebody that doesn't think straight, you'll never be able to negotiate a disagreement. Because you say one thing and I'll say something entirely different. We're not talking about that. What does that have to do with the price of tea in China? If you want to negotiate a compromise, if you want to work out a difference, if you want to explain a position, but the other person could only see their way and they, 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 they can't think it through because they don't know how to think straight, then you'll never be able to work out a problem. You'll be constantly fighting or you'll be constantly giving in and unhappy. So say Yosha, thinking straight, is very important. By the way, that's another reason to marry a ben Tyre. Talmida chachom in ma'abim sholom ba'ilam. You know, we learn a lot of things in Gemara that don't seem to have to do with anything. Here we have a mesefta called Me'ila, a whole 30 blot about the laws of trespassing on the temple. We don't have a temple. We don't bring a carbon osha me'ila anymore. What do I have to learn it for? Why do I have to learn all the laws of the paraduma, the red cow, or the egg laru for breaking the heifer, heifer's neck for an unsolved homicide? We don't have that. The answer is, is that by studying the arguments between Rabbi Yoich and Reish Lakish, between Abaya and Rava, between Beisil and Beishama, and the give and take, they think straight. I'm training my mind to think straight. That's Das Torah. Thinking straight. But you have to find a young man to th- and by the way, you have to train yourself also to think straight. Because that's what the good boys are looking for. Another thing. Throwing a lot of things at you. And by the way, this is a very important tape to review. I am recording this CD. If anybody wants a copy of this CD, uh, 718-916-3100. 718-916-3100. Uh, you could call me or text me at that number, or my email is rmmwsi at aol.com. rmmwsi, that's Rabbi Moshe Mayer Weiss, Staten Island, at aol.com. And it's $7.00. It's five dollars for the CD plus postage and handling, so it's seven dollars. And uh, I, you just order it, and I'll send it to you with a stamped return envelope for your payment. So again, that's seven one eight nine one six thirty one hundred. And incidentally, if somebody wants to sponsor one of these shiurim, it's three hundred dollars or three sixty to be a postal sponsor. Uh, and again, that number is seven one eight nine one six thirty one hundred. R-M-M-W-S-I at AOL.com. Another important feature is Simcha Sachayim. person should have, be a happy person. You see, when you get married, you are locked to the moods of your husband. 
can't get away with. Can't get away from it. If your husband is going to be morose and gloomy and you're with him, he's going to pull you down. Now, a lot of girls make a mistake. They tell their, they tell their parents, yeah, he's a good boy. He's serious. He's serious-minded. I know he'll take care of me. He's stable. But they confuse serious and they don't realize that the person is morose. When you get married, you are stuck with your husband's moods. And therefore, marrying a person who sees the cup half full instead of half empty is very important. Rabbi Yechonin tells us that a smile in the house is more important than a cup of milk. Now, milk is very important. You don't have milk for the baby, you've got to go out to a 7-Eleven to buy in from in the middle of the night. And milk is important. But he says that showing someone your teeth, that means a smile, is more important than milk. It's a mimer of the Gadol Adar, Rabbi Yechonin. Rabbi Yechonin lived to be 400 years old. He knew a lot. Marrying a person that has happiness, you know, a husband once came to me and said, I was very upset. What are you so upset about? Said, you know, I hear my wife laughing on the phone when she talks to her friend. She never laughs with me. So I looked him in the eye and I said, tell me, do you know how to giggle? I don't think you know how to giggle. I never saw you giggle. I never saw you laugh. Her friends are laughing on the other side of the phone. She's laughing with them. You want to laugh, your wife to laugh, you have to give her, give her a smile. You have to give her a giggle. In, in a marriage, we're like a mirror to our spouse. Our spouse reflects our mood. And that's why to marry somebody that's happy, that has an inner happiness, is oh so important. And the same thing is true. There's a warmth quotient. One of the most uh, frequent complaints that I hear in Shalom Bayi's problems is she'll tell me, you know he's a block of ice. He'll say she's frigid. There's no emotion, there's no feeling, there's no tenderness. Try to marry somebody that has a personal warmth, who knows how to give affection. And by the way, you have to learn how to do that. In marriage, the best way to get something is to give it. You want affection, you're going to have to be affectionate. You want patience, you're going to have to learn to be patient. You want him to put you first, then you're going to have to know how to put him first. But Palm used to say that the reason why the bride walks around the chosen seven times is she's making a statement that from now on she's making him the center of her universe. You're going to have to make him number one if you want him to make you number one. If you treat him like a king, he'll treat you like a queen. If you treat him like a cash register, he'll treat you like his maid. The marriage is very reciprocal. I've overwhelmed you <laughs> with a lot of details. Um, but I can't impress upon you enough that this is a life decision like none other. More important where you're going to live, more important what you're going to do, more important even than when you send your children to yeshiva is who you marry. So look before you leave. Now, you should never marry because your parents tell you to marry someone. You have to marry them. You have to feel in your heart. But if your parents tell you not to marry someone, then listen with both ears. Remember, your, 
bias. You might have a physical attraction. You might be infatuated. You might be frustrated. They have more experience. I always tell my children, I will never tell you who to marry. But you better listen to me and mommy if we tell you not to marry someone. That's a big yesai. Davin for a good shidduch. Take advice. If not your parents and not a Bubby and Zaidi, then a Rav, a mentor that you could go to and say, you know, this is bothering me. Is this something I should be bothered with or not? The schus of us learning of what to look for and wanting to do the right thing. May Hashem bless you all and all those that are listening or watching with the Zivig Hogan, with the proper Zivig, quickly and easily. Remember, we all have a Zivig that's assigned from us in heaven. We just have to do the proper Ishtadlis. Do not, do not fall into the pitfall of saying, well, maybe there's something better out there. If that's the reason why you say no, you should know there are spinsters in their 60s because they said maybe there's something better. That's not a reason to say no to a shit. Keep an open mind. Sometimes there is a flaw. My youngest daughter, wonderful girl, Metalamilus, took a young man that has hearing aids in both his ears. But she looked past that because he was an incredible Ben Taira. He came from an incredible family. He was an incredible Balmidas. He was handsome. So he has two hearing aids. She's deliriously happy. He's wonderful to her. You have to keep an open mind Sometimes there could be a wrinkle. But you can look past it if you say to yourself, while well, this person is, is, is make me a great husband. Rav David Krengas used to say, more important than you liking the boy is to make sure that he likes you. Be 100% sure that he really likes you. Because if he likes you, he'll be good to you. Don't try to push it. Yeah, but you know, let's try it again another day. You want him to want you. It's not enough that you want him. More important, the double crown less, more important than you like the boy. Make sure that he likes you. Also, give it a chance. Don't make up your mind in the first 20 seconds. I don't like his nose. Forget it. <laughs> those glasses. Ooh, who could pick those glasses? Look at that. Look at that tie. Who is such a slim tie? Those shoes make him look like a butcher. Don't don't make up your mind. I know many cases that a girl gave it a little chance, and she said, "Well, I can't believe I almost gave up on my life's happiness." Don't make up your mind in the first twenty seconds. Now, Hashem should give you the siyat the dishmaya that it should be easy and you should find your Zivik Hagen and know that it's your Zivik Hagen with a certainty, with ease. You've just experienced another Torah class brought to you by TorahAnytime.com.